Okay. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you to Bo River. Bo -Bo. It's been several years since I've done a presentation on acoustic guitars, so you may have to bear with me a little bit here. But um, as many of you have read or may know, I founded Santa Cruz Guitar Company back in 1976. My uh, original partner, Bill Davis, and I uh, were working at a local music store, Union Grove Music, and we uh, uh, both were pairing. And in one day walks my future partner, Dick Hoover, with a guitar he had just completed studying from a guy named Bruce McGuire, who was a local luthier there, who had also gotten a lot of tips from an elder gentleman who had written the book, Art Holter So that kind of gives you a little bit of history that Santa Cruz was starting to be kind of a nexus of guitar building. So Bill and I uh, thought, well, gee whiz, someone can build guitars, it's actually possible. Unbelievable. And so we threw together some money, we bought some tools, got a partnership going, we invited Dick Hoover to come in and teach us how to do this thing. Dick was a little reticent at first because he didn't know if this venture was going to fly. So he said, I'll, I'll hang with you guys for a while and just kind of feel it out and see how it goes. So Bill ultimately left the original partner and Dick bought his partnership and Dick and I continued on as a, as a partnership with Santa Cruz Guitar Company until I left the company in 1989. Uh, and in 89, I started doing some consulting for Martin, Gibson, and um, as was mentioned, several companies overseas. Mostly a variety of different things they wanted to know, but mostly having to do with wood, curiously enough. They wanted to increase their supplies of wood. They didn't particularly, they weren't particularly interested in what I knew about acoustic guitars. So I thought this evening what I would do would be to tell you some of the things I learned over the 13 or so years of acoustic guitar construction that I felt were significant and important and perhaps distinguished our guitars in some way from other people's. Um, first and foremost, I should say that I was blessed or cursed, depending on how you look at it, with a pair of good ears. I can hear, I have bad hearing, my, my daughters say. I can hear very well. I can also discern tones very well. This helped me when I was a, uh, um, oops, yeah, this is, sorry about that. This was uh, a huge aid to me when I was a musician. I could figure out songs pretty easily off albums and such. What it also helped me to do was to listen very intently and closely to acoustic guitars and try to figure out what made one different from the other. And to that end, I started theorizing about how the acoustic guitar could be braced differently, how it could be thickness differently to achieve different results. And I wanted to give a little bit of context about our company before I get down to the nitty gritty of, of what I'm gonna say this evening. Back in the 60s, uh, there was a huge explosion in the pop and rock and roll era, and the guitar really took over as the instrument of prominence from the viol family, from the uh, piano, from the woodwinds, from the traditional band instruments that you may have seen people <coughs> playing. After the Beatles came along, the world changed. And part of that was in response to kids wanting to be able to play the guitar. That was the one thing that I think distinguished my interest in guitars and love for it was first and foremost being a musician and then wanting to learn how to build them. Secondly, in response to this huge increase in demand, C.F. Martin did a thing which now I assume they regret. They increased their production and they made just crap guitars. So you will see, most it is generally regarded that the 60s and 70s Martins are not shining examples of what the Martin Guitar Company was prior to that. The Zenith, the kind of the, the top of what they did was the pre-war, the pre-World War II era. And that's kind of the sound that we were after, if you will. I think those two things really led us into the market, if you will, and really allowed us to become a factor where we otherwise probably would not have, because we were undercapitalized and not particularly knowledgeable about what we were doing. The third thing that really put us on the map, and probably many of you don't know Tony Rice, but he was a pretty prominent and famous bluegrass guitar player back in the uh, 70s. 
He was responsible for uh, identifying the new acoustic music, which was, was called New Grass at that time. It was based on bluegrass that had jazz influence. Well, he came to see us, and he wanted us to build him a guitar, which we did, and we built him another one, which we did, and another, and another, until we got it right, so to speak. And I think uh, once it was found out that Tony had played our guitars, and that we had built him a series of guitars, we started getting other musicians that are well known coming to us for instruments as well. And that also helped establish us. Um, I think, well, first of all, let me ask you, how many people here have built a guitar? Good, that's, that's pretty, how many have built more than one? Okay, so most of you are pretty familiar with how a guitar goes, goes together and so forth. And uh, I assume, did you learn by yourself, or did you go through the internet? Did you get a book? Compiano's book. Who's? William Compiano. Oh yeah, that's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. Page by page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he does a fine job. Back when I started out, there was no one doing that. I think uh, David Russell Young, anybody familiar with his book? Yeah. He was probably the first person, and it was more or less a coffee table book, meaning that it was not designed to be exactly a blow-by-blow -blow of how you do an acoustic guitar. But there was nothing else. We had to basically figure it out. And I'm forever in debt uh, a debt of gratitude to the first customers of our guitars because they were pretty pretty bad, you know, the first few years. So one of the things that I did back then, um, my task in the, du the duo that we had was to do the sound work. And I really threw myself into doing as much research and thinking about how to manipulate the soundboard as I could possibly do. I read a lot of what I could get my hands on about old violin texts, which didn't directly apply because that's a carved arch surface versus a flat surface, right? This is a very different thing. But it got me stimulated my thinking on why they did certain features of the thinning of the top in certain places and how they were trying to maximize the tone. Um, Back then, it was regarded that everybody did a, a straight flat top. The top was equally thickness across the, the width of the soundboard. I always wondered why that made sense. And so I started experimenting with what we called eventually a graduated soundboard. And I would urge all of you who are making guitars to consider doing this, which is a little thicker on the treble side and a little thinner on the bass side. Um, I think or I, I used to build in millimeters, so I'll talk in millimeters rather than thousands. And the reason I did that is because all the tools came from Germany and they're in millimeters, so you're kind of stuck. But uh, let's say the average soundboard was uh, generally regarded to be 2.5 millimeters. Well, I would do a 2.6 or a 2.7 millimeter treble side down to a 2.3 or 2.2 on the bass side. And it would be a gradual thickness all the way down. And then once the guitar, the soundboard was fixed onto the rims, I would come back and I would start sanding more heavily. It's okay if I draw a little bit in these areas. So over the the as it was approaching the finishing end of the business, I was taking off more material here and further graduating the top and then slightly less material here. So that generally if you looked at this cross section of the soundboard, it was thicker under the bridge, the treble side, graduating to thinner under the bridge and then graduating all the way out thinner. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that or that explanation suffice? <coughs> And I noticed when I, immediately when I started doing that, the guitars had what I referred to as a jumpier sound. They, they jumped right out initially. They sounded older right off the bat. The tone bloomed quicker. It didn't take as much effort, it seemed, to get the tone going. And what I was after was trying to balance the almighty dreadnought, which is the most popular guitar on the planet, the acoustic steel string guitar on the planet, and try to get a better presence of the treble mixed with the mid-range and the bass. And it, I just found, this, I was continually frustrated by the way in which dreadnoughts tend to have an overpowering bass and sacrifice completely the treble. 
So that was one kind of novel thing that we began doing, and we had great success with that. Um, the second thing that we did was to take the standard belly bridge that Martin is famous for. We redesigned that and made it a little narrower. And one thing that we did um, is to take the uh, bridge slot down deeper into the ebony. Martin tends to put their bridge, um, their slot rather, um, fairly shallow in the uh, shallow in the ebony bridge itself. It gave it kind of a muddier sound for me. If you, uh, we found, if you get the bridge down closer to the t uh, soundboard, you get a brighter sound. Now you have to like that sound, or you have to feel that sounds desirable, and that's something that we experimented with. And I would urge you to just experiment with how far down or, or close to the surface you do your bridge slot, your saddle slot. Um, everyone is traditionally is familiar with the traditional scallop brace that Martin does. It's pretty much a standard in the industry. Today, I think you'd be hard pressed to find any manufacturer that doesn't do that, and we were forced to do that as well. I've never been a real fan of that style of bracing, but we had to do it for Tony's sake, and so uh, we adapted it to our to suit our needs. One of the things we did is that we started on ours scallops like this, but we didn't do the main X nearly as deep. That may be standard in the industry now, but I can, I've seen some older markers that have very heavy scalloping through the main X section. We would scallop the hell out of these tone bars. These are referred to as tone bars. And we would have the peaks somewhere like this, and we would really scallop these boys off, again, to get a more lively soundboard and a, and a, a jumpier tone from what, uh, what we could experience. Um, the, but I still wasn't pleased with the sound of our dreadnoughts because they sounded 